Hi, my name is Chris Bronston, and the uh, title of this talk is Post Truth Scientific Discourse. And I'll explain throughout the uh, talk what I mean by this and uh, why uh, this kind of post truth era gives you some sort of uh, slightly strange issues in the world of data science. So I should start maybe by introducing myself. I could probably be called a data scientist or a spatial data scientist, perhaps more particularly, although I'm pretty old and actually I was doing what might have been called spatial data science quite some time before it was actually called that. Um, and the sort of tools I tend to use are things like statistical analysis, I make uh, mathematical models of things and use those to understand spatial processes in areas uh, like the environment, but also a lot of uh, human and social uh, aspects such as uh, crime, looking at house prices, things of this sort. I also use techniques like data mining so to try to find interesting patterns in very large data sets. And I like to use visual tools. And again, being a spatial data scientist, one of those would be uh, the map, but also a number of other kinds of, of visualizations uh, as well. And the reason I'm trying to do this broadly is to understand spatial processes and to be able to um, see what processes are currently going on and how maybe they will evolve in the future. And obviously, to do that, I have to use a lot of mathematical modeling and I have to make a lot of use of scientific evidence. So how has the idea of post-truth entered my life? Well, um, oddly enough, um, for a lot of the people I work for, um, they are involved in things like uh, policy making or the dissemination of information. These are things, this is perhaps the main reason why I do a lot of this work. I have to do it to uh, enable people to make decisions about policies or to uh, inform people about uh, what things are going on, usually through the, the visualizations and so forth. And uh, for example, um, one of the things I have done is looked at uh, climate change and particularly um, looking for sort of patterns there are in existing climate data, particularly, again, geographical patterns, and also to uh, make forecasts about what's going on in the future. And these forecasts, of course, have to be made um, based on an understanding of scientific processes, um, and uh, models are calibrated, mathematical models are calibrated according to these processes, and we basically uh, look at, A, how much uh, certain models are supported given the, uh, the data we have and also the, the, the models themselves and the theory underlying them and how that might evolve into the future. So, well, that doesn't sound very post-truth. It all sounds actually fairly um, objective, quite sort of staid scientific uh, method. But um, a rather interesting thing happened in 2012 in North Carolina, um, something in state law called House Bill 819. And um, what this actually does it prohibits state policymakers from using the most scientifically accepted sea level projections in their decisions. And in their place, it promotes a climate prediction methods that most uh, scientists and climate scientists would regard as grossly inaccurate. Uh, it's based only on historical data and it doesn't make use of projections, and so it uh, can't really make use of the uh, sorts of um, projections I was talking about, the sorts of models that will tell you how things like sea level change may uh, alter from now uh, moving forward, say, into uh, about a century's time. But yet, these are quite important things to do. If you build in certain areas that are likely to be uh, underwater now, well, buildings generally stay around for quite a long while, quite easily 100 years or so. And so, you know, it matters what's going to happen there, and the predictions are quite uh, important. And so, basically, um, if you um, ignore the, um, some of these prediction models, and in particular, um, look at don't look at projections that are based on the amount of greenhouse gases that uh, have been released, then you will get um, very different models, but to be honest, quite unrealistic models, because we know that these things are actually happening. There's much uh, evidence for that. Um, and the other thing that this uh, uh, House Bill 819 does is it actually limits the, um, the next um, state-sponsored report to only analysing what will happen over the next 30 years. So, as I say, maybe you need to think about 100 years' time practically and realistically, but um, it's actually prohibited this report from, from doing this. And this, of course, massively reduces the scope for long-term decision-making and planning. So, OK, well, that's, that's a bit of background. It's rather uh, an interesting idea. Basically, this is um, state uh, law that prohibits 
policymakers from analysing data and making models in a certain way, or if not actually prohibit them from doing it, prohibit them from including them into any official reports or from um, them being considered to, uh, to make uh, planning policy. So when um, their first report uh, came out, this is the, the North Carolina um, sea level uh, rise assessment report, which was made by the North Carolina Coastal Resources Commission Science Panel on Coastal Hazards. They were the authors of this. They published this graph. And what this graph is showing you, if you look at the, um, the red curve, that's about the worst case scenario in terms of the model of um, sea level rises. If you look at the, um, the blue curve, that's a kind of middle level prediction. And about the, um, the, the best case, but it's incredibly optimistic, is the, the green line on there. And the purple um, graph at the beginning is actually the, um, the true data for um, between 1978 and 2002. So basically, what they've done is they've got some historical information. Uh, as I say, if you just draw a straight line through it, you get what's probably a rather optimistic um, model. And then two more realistic models are the ones with the blue and the red curve. And they don't just go up in a straight line. They're increasing non-linearly and actually increasing quite a lot. So the uh, sea level rise in um, 2100 is about um, 1.4 metres, which is actually quite a, a notable amount. And that, OK, it's quite an alarming graph, but as I say, it's based on the best knowledge that people have at the time and the most accurate models that have been verified in a number of ways. Uh, geographically, these are quite uh, sort of concerning graphs. So, in fact, if you look at the graph on the uh, left-hand side, that's the upper limit, so that's the, 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 the most pessimistic of the forecast. And you can see there the blue areas are the areas that would actually be um, under water or at least uh, very much uh, susceptible to flooding uh, with this model, whereas the, um, the other areas uh, are on the right-hand side. OK, there's less of them, but even there, there seems to be you know, quite a few levels that uh, look to be under threat over the next uh, 100 years or so. So geographically, there are quite big changes. North Carolina is somewhere that's um, quite um, vulnerable to, uh, to flooding. So that, that's um, part of the issue. And OK, so those graphs that I showed you on the previous slide are quite concerning because they do suggest that this is what would happen from a geographical viewpoint. Um, of course, as well as the geographical consequences, you have the economic consequences that essentially um, these projections would um, place the, uh, the permits for many planned development projects into jeopardy. Um, you're not going to uh, give planning permission to build housing in an area that's likely to be in a flood zone. And the new flood zone areas would have to be drawn, um, new waste treatment plants would have to be built and roads would have to be elevated. So there's a lot of economic consequences for this. Um, it's obviously going to matter if uh, quite a large uh, amount of your um, area is going to be uh, underwater, or at least susceptible to flooding. And who weren't very happy with that report in 2010? Well, um, one group that weren't very happy was uh, a group, a property development group called NC20, North Carolina 20. And um, they have... Um, a lot of plans to develop property in those areas that I just showed you on the, on the map. And one quote from Tom Thompson, who's the president of this, uh, of, of this group, uh, he says, I don't want to say they're being dishonest, but they're pulling out data out of their hip pocket that ain't working. Now, he didn't exactly specify why it wasn't working, but um, you might um, get some idea of where he's coming from. A, by noting he is the, uh, the president of this, uh, this group, but also he stated that um, the Resources Commission failed to consider the economic consequences of preparing the coast for a one-metre rise in sea level. Now, really, that wasn't um, what they were meant to be doing. They were just actually analysing the, uh, the, 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 the uh, climate data. But um, when he says they failed to consider the economic consequences, you slightly get the impression of thinking, well, um, perhaps they shouldn't say it if um, it's going to um, affect her decisions to develop her property, um, the economic consequences being the sort of ones that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, I think when he said they didn't consider the, um, the economic consequences, that's probably where he was uh, coming from. So what then happened? Well, um, as you can see, um, there was um, 
uh, legislation that uh, prohibited certain kinds of uh, climate modelling, and also in this legislation, this report had to be republished with a certain number of changes, and in particular this thing about not making um, predictions over a certain horizon and uh, only working with historical data and so forth. And when the report was republished in 2016, you can look at these two links here and you can see the old report and the new one, and the graph from the original report isn't there anymore, and as one or two uh, paragraphs missing, and mainly ones that referred to the things that uh, were shown on previous slides. So, essentially what's happened here is that um, the policy felt that uh, it might be economically damaging to make that information known, and therefore um, that it was actually withdrawn. OK, actually, this was something that was noted in the US, and um, there was you know, quite a number of um, people that commented on them. And Stephen Colbert uh, put it probably quite nicely, which is basically saying, well, um, you know, first off, you can make the observation that this isn't evidence-based policy. This is policy-based evidence. We're saying that you know, under certain economic policies, we don't want certain um, object well, scientific reports to be, um, to be published. And as he says, if your science gives you a result that you don't like, pass a law saying that the result is illegal. Problem solved. So that's quite a worrying prospect. So, OK, it's not actually illegal to model sea level changes in alternative ways, but what you can't do is apparently in North Carolina put them in reports. Your report would not be legally accepted if you did this, and therefore this prohibits them from ever influencing any policy. So, Although you could, yeah, okay, it's not as though your, your laptop's going to be seized from you because you've done some sort of statistical analysis that uh, wasn't in line with what they wanted, but certainly you'd have a job um, using that in any kind of discourse. That's my uh, sort of PTSD pun here, the, this uh, post-truth scientific discourse. Um, and, um, of course, some of the other things that have been happening recently in terms of uh, looking at climate change means that not only is it difficult to do the research, but also the funding for this in the future is not likely to, um, to, to be forthcoming, uh, not in the, the immediate future anyway, I would guess. And even existing um, uh, resources such as uh, publicly available, openly available climate change data um, are under threat. So um, in that case, OK, well, where do we go from here? Well, you know, one of the answers, to be honest, is I don't know. I wish I did know. But um, one of the things I suppose that is quite important here is, wherever possible, to push for open and reproducible research so that any models you do have uh, that you want to justify, you make the code available, you make the, um, the, the, the data openly available, and you make your reports openly available so that they are open to scrutiny. And at least then, if someone does go back and uh, use the, um, the idea of, what was it, uh, pulling data out of your pocket that it just ain't right. Well, OK, um, this is how I've developed my data. How do you get yours? And you have to be prepared to uh, get involved in a lot of discourses. But um, certainly in this post-truth era, it's making being a, a data scientist uh, a, a degree more interesting than perhaps it was uh, five or six years ago. Thanks.